Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. Thank you, as always, for being here. Uh, as always, just uh, giving it a moment to let everybody join. Uh, we have a special uh, Grand Rounds today by one of our own, uh, Dr. Tyler Johnson. And we really don't have too many updates. It's always nice after the years we've had. That was nice to say. We don't have too many updates uh, in regards to uh, really any calamity right now. So it's nice. Um, as I like to just say, if there is something that you would like seeing updated at Grand Rounds or something updated throughout our communication streams, emails, uh, newsletters, so on, please do reach out anytime to us and we're happy to make sure whatever you want to see covered is covered. So thanks so much again for being here today. Uh, without further ado, um, we don't really, uh, we don't have, again, any updates uh, whatsoever, but if there's anything you want, let us know. I do want to briefly mention uh, upcoming Grand Rounds next week. Uh, this one is Overcoming Paternalism in Medical Decision-Making, Developing and Testing a Digital Patient Tool for Atrial Fibrillation Stroke Prevention by Dr. Randall Stafford. He actually just sent us a bunch of the um, information yesterday. We'll be sending this out the email as well, the new tools he and his team have been working on. So we'll be sharing that shortly as well without the community, but um, this will be on Zoom and uh, please do join us again next week. Okay, so without further ado, we have today's Grand Round speaker, Dr. Tyler Johnson. Dr. Tyler Johnson is a clinical assistant professor uh, and a medical oncologist. He sees patients with all types of gas gastrointestinal malignancies and particularly focuses on patients with neuroendocrine tumors, colon cancer and pancreas cancer. He's the assistant director of the inpatient oncology service, service here at Stanford. For many years, Dr. Johnson has taught medical students, residents, fellows, hosting them as temporary and long-term apprentices in oncology clinic, working with them in the inpatient house staff oncology service with an emphasis on diversity and inclusion. As the winner of mo multiple Stanford Medicine Teaching Awards, Dr. Johnson established himself as a regional and increasingly as a national leader and innovator in education with oncology and particularly with fellows, uh, and has presented across the country, including at national meetings. Uh, he's a principal faculty member for the Stanford Educators for Care program. Dr. Johnson is an author with a growing reputation for insightful analysis of the intersection of medicine, ethics, and spirituality. His writings have been featured on religion news services, the Salt Lake Tribune, BYU Studies, Dialogue, and the San Jose Mercury News, where he's a regular contributor. Dr. Johnson and his co-host, a former Stanford medical student, Henry Baer, uh, became concerned about the loss of a shared sense of meaning in the medical profession. And together they have taught multiple classes at the, at the School of Medicine. And in spring of 2022, they founded the podcast called The Doctor's Art. This podcast explores a humanistic side of medicine attempting to discover how healthcare workers can return to meaning to practice to the practice of medicine. Podcast guests have included patients, doctors, nurses, IC nurses, authors, journalists, CEOs, really the whole spectrum that it affects medicine and our care. Uh, interestingly uh, and amazingly, just only being out since spring of 2022, it has over 2.4 thousand ratings on Apple Podcasts, along with a rating of 4.9 out of 5. We've had presenters such as Victor Zhao, and I mentioned ICU nurses up to Francis Collins and our own members as well, like Dr. Vergeese, who's here on the panelists with us today. It's one of the most listened medical podcasts in the nation with a growing national and international listenership. Uh, it's been on Med, uh, Page Today's Reader's Choice Award and also designated as a Webby honoree, which is kind of like the Oscars of podcasts. So uh, Dr. Johnson, amazing work that I've, I've known you for years. You're a, a colleague, a friend, it's been amazing to see all the wonderful things that you do. Congratulations on just your newest endeavor uh, on this podcast. And thank you for being here to present lessons learned from 65 hours of discussing meaning in medicine. Thanks so much. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Errol, for uh, that very kind and generous introduction. Uh, and I am going to share my screen. Oh, hold on one second. I actually need to make sure that I share the sound as well. Okay. Just making sure, can everyone see my slides? Can I get a thumbs up, Beryl? Okay, perfect. perfect. Okay, so uh, everybody knows this. In medicine, we have a big problem. And this is an article that uh, originally came out in 2014, although I guess according to this webpage, it was updated in some fashion in 2018, but it was called, it was on the Daily Beast. It was quite a popular article called How Being a Doctor Became the Most Miserable profession. Uh, 
And uh, this came out just as I was finishing my year as a chief resident at Stanford. And I remember seeing this and thinking, oh, that sounds kind of dramatic on the one hand. And on the other hand, thinking that it was just sort of a tragedy that anybody who was involved in medicine felt the need to write an article like this. But I think that the uh, almost decade since this article originally came out has demonstrated that uh, it was in part reporting on what was already going on and in part has proved prophetic. Since then, we have had a cascade of bad and often seemingly even worse news. It often feels, although there are some, of course, some exceptions to this rule, like you can't read anything about how things are going in medicine, in particular with regards to the wellness of healthcare practitioners, without finding out that we are really in dire straits. And I want to talk just a little bit about some of the evidence for that. This is a 2021 AMA report of national burnout statistics. And what you can see here is that although many people, even in the general population, were reporting some symptoms of burnout, those symptoms were significantly worse among uh, physicians. And as we would sometimes say, these appear to be both statistically and clinically significantly worse. And they were already really bad. This graph goes back even further than that article that I mentioned about how uh, doctoring became the most miserable profession. These were really bad all the way back through the 2010s. But then you can see, and this can hardly surprise any of us who lived through it, that they became then even another uh, order of magnitude, so to speak, worse during the pandemic with the uh, percentage of physicians who were reporting burnout then jumping by almost 20%. This has also um, been looked at by professional consulting agencies. So this is a report from Bain and Company, which uh, this was came out a little bit uh, but less than a year ago. And at that time, they reported that a full quarter of US clinicians were considering switching careers. I think that many of us have had uh, experiences where we know people who have stepped away from medicine. And I want to be really careful that we don't uh, frame this as a failure. I don't think that stepping away from medicine is a failure. And of course, for some people, in some cases, that's the right decision. But it is nonetheless striking that uh, this is something that is uh, that has become so difficult for so many people. And of course, it's hardly surprising, given these statistics and this report from a professional consulting company, that it's also being reported uh, frequently in the lay press. So this is an article from the New York Times uh, entitled, Physician Burnout Has Reached Distressing Levels, New Research Finds, and here they uh, report that at least two-thirds of doctors are experiencing at least one symptom of uh, burnout, which was a huge increase from the way that things were before the pandemic. Again, this was reported about a year ago. By the same token, uh, this was written by a actually a resident at the University of Chicago who also has a PhD in anthropology. This is starting to get at some of the reasons for the epidemic of burnout. Uh, he's acknowledging that it's a systemic problem and then saying that he thinks the problem is not actually that we're working too much, but rather that the uh, healthcare system is set up in such a way that we are uh, that it demoralizes us inherently. This is an article that came out, a lengthy article that came out in the Sunday edition of the New York Times just a couple of weeks ago, referring to the moral crisis of America's doctors, saying that the corporatization of healthcare has changed the practice of medicine, causing many physicians to feel alienated from their work. If you go through and read this entire article, it talks in great detail about a number of anecdotes from physicians' lives, demonstrating the reasons that uh, potentially some of the reasons why they feel that uh, burnout is such a problem. And then this is, uh, again, we'll talk a little bit more about the causes here in a moment, but I think that this article is mostly uh, interesting. I like the headline of this article because it states that the business of healthcare depends on exploiting doctors and nurses. This is from a few years ago, actually before the pandemic. But what strikes me about this headline is simply the fact that this uh, very famous author uses the word exploit or exploitation to describe the way that healthcare workers are used within the system, which regardless of whether she is correct in her diagnosis of what's causing the problem, I think the very fact that a physician is led to use a term like that says something very significant about the extent of the burnout epidemic. <laughs> 
So I think that everybody agrees that this is a pressing problem, but what's causing it, of course, figuring out what's causing it is a lot more complicated. So I think that I'm going to go through very quickly a number of the systemic factors that I think people have suggested may have at least contributed to the epidemic of burnout, although that's not the focus of my presentation. But I want to discuss this as part of the context because I think it's important for understanding what we're going to talk about later. So one thing is that everybody agrees that the corporatization of medicine has led to a sea change in the way that doctors practice. It was, of course, previously the case that most doctors were fairly independent agents, whether that meant that you went out and hung up your shingle as an independent practitioner in an outpatient clinic, or whether it meant that you were so supposed to be operating like an independent superhero in the hospital who could do everything. The point was that you were fairly autonomous and could largely do could largely one, run things the way that you wanted to. But now, of course, that is becoming increasingly less and less true. Fewer and fewer physicians are truly autonomous, and the large majority of us, including all of us at Stanford, are employees of larger institutions. Now, of course, this has some benefits, and there are some reasons that even physicians who are organizing themselves have sometimes organized themselves in this manner, but it also has some significant drawbacks, and some of those things I think have had, uh, people have argued, have helped lead to the epidemic of burnout. Similarly, of course, all of us are aware of the EMR and the way that that affects our daily practice, right? So whether you're topic, talking about Epic, specifically the EMR in general, having to go through click menus, the stuff that you have to do for billing, adding .rcc to all of your inpatient notes at Stanford, it just seems to go on and on forever. Of course, there's been important research that has come out of our own institution about the amount of time that uh, internal medicine residents, for example, spend in front of a computer screen as opposed to in front of the patients. Dr. Verghese uh, had an article that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine on Christmas Day a number of years ago, focusing on uh, the fact that it often seems like we care more for the digital avatars of our patients than we do for the patients themselves. And I certainly think that this is also something that can be argued to have contributed. We also uh, have a system that asks endlessly more of us. That article that I mentioned about the exploitation, that, that the business of healthcare is built on the exploitation of healthcare workers, I think rem reminds us that part of the problem potentially is that you have a group of workers who, because of altruistic motivations, are willing to give essentially endlessly to, uh, to help shore up the system and to do more work and take care of more patients. But then you have a business side of medicine that too often is interested primarily in squeezing out more and more and more efficiency from its doctors. And when you combine what often feels like, although of course it actually isn't, an endless supply of goodwill labor with people who want to squeeze endless efficiency out of that same pool of laborers, that's going to lead to problems. Of course, all of us are familiar with RVUs and LTRs. If there are some new folks uh, on in the meeting today who don't know LTR, that's the likelihood to recommend score. And as most of you who work in outpatient clinics will be familiar with LTRs, um, although thankfully we haven't emphasized these as much uh, in some places in the uh, in the Stanford healthcare system recently, it used to be the case that the only top line result that you got was what percentage of your patients who had seen you in clinic gave you the very top score in your likelihood to recommend. And that was really the only thing that mattered. And then of course, everything has to be filtered through RVUs. And if you're not making enough RVUs, no matter how good of a job you may be doing otherwise in any other metric as a doctor, you can't justify your existence because it doesn't uh, allow Stanford sufficient funds coming in from what you're doing, along with your research and other things to be able to pay you. And so again, I think a lot of people have argued that these have become sort of, uh, they are looked at often as surrogates for the kind of care we deliver, even though the relationship between these and the care that we deliver is certainly debatable. It's also true that too many physicians are not fully seen and are treated fundamentally unfairly. Uh, and there's no question that this contributes to burnout and contributes to burnout in a thousand different ways, whether it's the fact that women don't get paid as much as men do for doing the same work, or as was recently pointed out by uh, pointed out on Twitter by one of our own, the fact that women don't even get uh, that 
physicians are not paid as much for taking care of women as they are for men, or whether it's sexual harassment, or whether it's patients treating you differently because of the color of your skin, or because of the language that you spoke growing up, or whatever it is, there are a thousand different ways that this is brought to bear. And I think that it's uh, important to recognize that we have physicians at Stanford, like Dr. Salas, who are leading national voices in calling out these problems and in pointing out, including in public forums like on Twitter, where these things uh, have become issues and how they affect things. I think it's also interesting to recognize that wellness is often treated like a novel idea, as if we only recognized in the last 10 years that this was something that was important. And along with that, I think there is often a, a feeling that wellness seems to command more talking than action. A couple of uh, important uh, ways of recognizing this, there's a very funny series of skits from the Twitter personality, Dr. Glaukenflecken, who's this uh, very influential comedian now, who's also an ophthalmologist, where he talks about, uh, he sort of shows a hospital that makes a big deal of, we've got your great wellness initiative and we're gonna increase your wellness and we care about the physicians so much. And then the sum total of the wellness initiative is a $5 co uh, card to the coffee cart, right? And I think that things like that make it seem as though, even though everybody wants to talk about how important wellness is, there's often a sense that we don't really give it its due in the way that it needs it. Another funny example of this, and I want to be clear, this is not a criticism of our residency program. I've checked, and this is the same thing at residency programs across the country. But there's this, every year, the house staff have to take this survey with it, where they report how good of a job their residency program is doing in a number of different domains, including on wellness. And one of the infamous questions from that survey asks if you've been shown the sleep, a module about the importance of good sleep hygiene during residency. So as a consequence, everybody watches this video module about how important sleep is. But of course, you watch that and then as an intern, and then you think to yourself, well, yeah, but I'm working 80 hours a week, like how many ways are there to rearrange the number of hours in the day and night, watching a video doesn't make it so that I sleep better, it just makes it so that I know more about how deleterious it is that I'm not sleeping. So it's just to say that for all of the talk about wellness, we're still in this sort of funny place where we talk a lot about it, but don't really know how to implement systemic solutions. So I want to be clear, I state all of this as the first thing. This is not really the focus of my talk, but I state all of it up front because I want it to be very clear that I'm, I and my co-host on the podcast are well aware of this. We know that these problems are real and we know that they loom large and it's probably impossible to parse out exactly what percentage of the wellness epidemic derives from this cause versus this cause versus this cause, but we want to make sure that we acknowledge that these systemic problems are really important. And furthermore, we want to make it clear that we applaud those who fight to create systemic solutions to these systemic problems. As is always the case with systemic problems, the difficulty in solving any of the things that we have talked about is that it's not a simple one-off solution, right? We're talking about reforming culture. We're talking about reforming big, complicated organizations. We're talking about solutions that have to involve the way that the federal government reimburses doctors for the things that they do, or the way that you have to annotate your, uh, your notations in Epic so that you make sure that you get paid appropriately and on and on and on. These are very, very complicated things and we don't want to take away from those. Far from taking away from them, we want to uh, applaud those who are working for these solutions and, and let them know that we uh, find ourselves in common cause with them. Nonetheless, Henry, who is a Stanford medical student who just graduated a month or so ago and is now in his intern year of his ophthalmology residency, we wondered together, we, as Errol mentioned, have taught a number of classes together at Stanford and uh, have become uh, colleagues and co-conspirators in a number of different initiatives. And about a year and a half ago, we began to wonder, in addition to all of those systemic things, is there also a more personal or intimate dynamic at play. Even within a broken system, we wanted to know if there were things that individual physicians could do to recapture the magic that once made medicine meaningful. I think that it's almost hard to remember sometimes in the face of all of the things that we've just been talking about and sort of summed up by that initial article that I shared about how medicine has become the most miserable profession. It's sometimes difficult to remember that 
Uh, for most of our history, medicine was known as the most noble profession, and sometimes it feels almost difficult to remember that that was ever the case, and we wanted to know, were there things that an individual could change within the context of these large systemic issues, even societal and cultural issues, that could still make a difference? And so, in a sense, to research the answer to this question and to, in effect, share the research in real time as we were having the conversations, we set out in March 2022 to interview anyone, anyone who we could find who we thought might have meaningful insights to offer and who was willing to sit down to talk to us. And the result of that uh, of that idea was that we launched about a year and a quarter ago this podcast called The Doctor's Art. You can find it online at the web address that is listed there. You can find it on all of the normal podcast uh, services. And in effect, what we have done is we have sat down and spoken with a long series of people, uh, mostly healthcare practitioners in one form or another, but a lot of people also who are not directly healthcare pra practitioners, including some people who have no direct connection to healthcare at all. And we have sat down and over and over again had some version of this conversation. What was it that made medicine meaningful? And what can we do now to try to recapture that meaning? The result is now 80 plus hours of one of the world's, This the, uh, the uh, blurb that went out said 65 hours, but I had to send in the title a number of months ago, and we've kept talking since then, so it's now 80 plus hours of one of the world's leading medical podcasts. Um, I like, I hope that Henry and I are good podcast co-hosts, but I think the immense and uh, pretty precipitous popularity of the program, it has mostly to do with the fact that there is a hunger in the medical community to explore this issue. I think that there is a sense that in addition to these systemic issues, which as I've mentioned, are very real, there is a sense that maybe there is something on the individual level that has been lost, and that it's worth the time to listen to these episodes to go along with us on the journey of trying to figure out what that might be. We have interviewed all different kinds of people. Uh, Errol mentioned this a little bit. You'll see on this list a number of people from our own institution, Dr. Cesar Padilla, Dean Minor, Dr. Winslow, Dr. Verghese, Dr. Coons, who used to be here is now at Yale, Dr. Harmon, uh, Dr. Anna Lemke, Dr. Bryant Lynn, Dr. Um, uh, one of our own, uh, actually a number of our own ICU doctors. We've also spoken with nurses from Stanford in addition to those local people. We've also talked and we've also spoken with a number of authors. We've spoken with journalists. We've spoken with ethicists. We've spoken with uh, patients themselves. We've spoken with patient caregivers and on and on and on and on. The list is pretty extensive and only growing. Rather than me just talking to you about what we have learned, I would like to listen briefly to four clips from uh, episodes that we have done over the past year and a half. I'm going to briefly introduce the clips and play them. They're about a minute apiece. And then after we have listened to the clips, I will try to distill down some core truths from that are sort of hinted at in the clips that we will listen to and that are also distilled from the 80 plus hours of conversations that we have now had. So first we're going to listen to a clip from, uh, I was all prepared to say our own Dr. Ajoa Boateng, except that she has, I think just is either in the process of leaving or has very recently left to, uh, I believe to go to Duke. But Dr. Boateng uh, is an ICU physician. We interviewed her very early in the program. And at one point during our interview, we asked her to tell us about an experience that she had as an ICU doctor where she felt like she was doing her most meaningful work, an experience that encapsulated what for her is really her purpose as an ICU doctor. And I want to listen to her answer. There was a, a patient that passed away in our ICU uh, about eight months ago who was quite young. And I could see the inner battle, the inner turmoil of him having to you know, say goodbye to his young children and his family, but also knowing and having full awareness that 
his disease state was not going to be survivable. And when he did transition to comfort care, the room was, it, it, it felt like a, like a church. It felt like a spiritual setting almost. We, he asked us to play music that he liked. So we put music on. His wife asked us to light candles. The chaplain was there. He had photos. He'd been in the ICU for many, many weeks. So he had photos all around. And, you know, we all kind of gathered around to him. And I sort of silently cried in the background because it was so touching. And I just will never forget what his wife kept saying to him as he really sort of gasped in his final breaths. And she said, I'll see you on the other side. I'll see you on the other side. I'll see you on the other side. So what strikes me so deeply and has struck me more deeply since the time of that interview is that when I think of the ICU, I think of this place where we send patients to undergo heroic, almost superhuman efforts to try to allow them to live, right? The ICU is where we put in central lines and use ventilators and ECMO and pressors and all the rest, right? It's The care is so complicated that many of the patients have to have a nurse who virtually never leaves their bedside because they require second to second or moment to moment adjustment of all of the different things that we're doing to keep them alive. And yet, when we asked a very experienced physician to sum up what she thought encapsulated the quintessential work of an ICU doctor, she told about taking care of a patient who was switched to comfort care and then died in the ICU. I think that's significant. There was a, a Next, I'd like to go. So after we interviewed Dr. Boateng, we asked her to recommend a nurse from the ICU who we could speak with, and she recommended Kristen Thankachan. And so we interviewed her a little bit later, and similarly, we asked her to tell us about a meaningful experience that she had had in the ICU as well, and this is what she recounted to us. We had a family visiting from another country. They had come for this big hiking trip. Patient had cancer in a series of unfortunate events and ended up on life support. But the patient was supposed to be hiking in Yosemite. That was what they were, the whole family was here. That was what they were going to do. Unfortunately, uh, it was a pulmonary embolus and they, they were here on life support. And, you know, I remember seeing this family that was far away from their home here. We could only have two people here and seeing their, these children, some on Zoom, some in person, grieving their parent. And I was, I sat there and I said, how can I make this better? I can't, they're gonna lose their parent. They're gonna lose their human. How can I connect them? I can't give them back Yosemite and I'm a terrible artist, <laughs> but we in the ICU, we have these glass doors. And I thought, well, I can't take them to Yosemite, but I can make Yosemite here. So drew El Capitan on the, on the, on the door. And I tried to print out what I could that, to make it look like Yosemite. The family came, we gathered who we could at the bedside and the patient was extubated, which means taking the breathing tube out. And the family appreciated that they were in Yosemite and in his favorite place sort of right there's a in the tragedy we find the good and finding the good is how can i remind you of what that person is to you a hiker in yosemite so i have similar a similar reaction to uh kristen thankachan's thoughts there i want to go to the next clip we had a family so this is a uh, psychologist and professor at uh, Berkeley who has dedicated his life to trying to understand largely to many things, but largely to trying to understand the experience of human awe. Uh, what do we mean when we say that we feel awe or wonder? Physiologically, what does that state represent? How could you, if you were looking at the human organism and tracking you know, body temperature and eye dilation, you know, pupil dilation and all of those things, what physiologic cues 
can we use to know when a person is experiencing wonder or awe? And, it, and he has spent decades trying to, in effect, break wonder down into its physiologic parts. And so we had a, a in-depth discussion with him about what that search for understanding the constituents of awe has taught him and whether there is anything left at the end of that quest that he still has difficulty explaining. When you write a book, uh, sometimes it, it turns personal like this book did. And I had to write about my brother who passed away and the awe that helped me in that bereavement process. And then there are also like words that keep coming at you that weren't there in the science, you know, and early and mystery was the key for me. I just kept coming to it. And I was thinking, you know, what's interesting, here's a finding, which is interesting, which is the more you practice awe, the richer it gets, right? The more you do certain pleasures, the, the less interesting they become, you know, I got my new shoes. I love them. They're amazing. They're amazing. And pretty soon you're like, they're just shoes. This is ridiculous. <laughs> you know, but awe is the opposite. It's like, the more you do it, it just gets richer and deeper. And I think it's because of mystery that it always has this grain of mystery in it that the minute you think you know something, then you're like, oh my God, but I don't know this. And I have to wonder about that. So, and Darwin was a great example where he just was always awestruck by his observations of the natural world. And it just let him, you know, just keep generating new ideas to, to fill out his theory of evolution. So mystery was key to writing the book. When you and then finally, we're going to listen to a clip from Dr. Elisha Waldman. Dr. Waldman was a pediatric oncologist, and then after about a decade in practice, uh, went back and did a palliative care fellowship and now practices, practices as, as a pediatric palliative care doctor in Chicago. And a large part of our conversation with him, maybe not surprisingly, given that he is a, pa a palliative care doctor, was about pain and suffering. And as a physician, what do you do when you are encountering pain and suffering with and on behalf of your patients? What do you make of that? How do you approach that? And and what do you do when you get to a point? So you've done all of the things, you've given anti-nausea medications and, and pain medications and all of these things. But at the end of all of that, when you've treated every symptom that you can treat, and there is still suffering that remains at the end of that, where do you go from there? And this is how he answered that. Then the sort of deeper level question is, when you come up against suffering that cannot be erased, that just is, then what? In, in 25 years in medicine, I've seen some amazing advances. I mean, think back to 25 years ago. I, we're doing stuff today that was science fiction back then, and it's amazing. The one thing I'm not convinced that we're doing better is addressing suffering. And in some respects, I think we're doing a little bit worse because we're awfully good at applying the science fiction without sort of pausing along the way to think about what we're doing. I don't know the answer. When you get to that molten core of suffering, when you sit with a patient who's just in the fire and you don't know what to do, I am not sure beyond presence, human presence, how to address it. There is an ineffable mystery that is great as well as terrible sitting at the center of all of this. And, you know, it's an honor and a challenge and beautiful and awful to be a part of it, all rolled up in one. And that's what keeps me going. Then all right. So thank you for sticking with me this far. We've got about 10 minutes left, and I'm going to try to now, from these 80 hours plus of conversation and a lot of uh, teaching and thinking and uh, conversing with friends and colleagues on the side, to distill down for you, what have we learned? So if we go back to this central question about that medicine has become so miserable, is there something there that we can still distill down that might be helpful to us individually? This is where we have arrived. <laughs>
people are not machines and doc doctors are not mechanics. Now, I want to be clear. I mean, I have no disrespect to mechanics for whom I'm grateful all the time that they can fix all of the many things that I have that go wrong in my life from cars to things in our house and whatever else. But people are not machines and doctors are not mechanics. This is one of the 20th century's most famous philosophers, Bertrand Russell, in a very famous essay called The Free Man's Worship. He said that in order to do, in order to have any appropriate reasoning in life, we have to first recognize that humans are what he called, quote, random collocations of atoms, unquote, and nothing more. By the same token, a sort of modern acolyte of Bertrand Russell, Yuval Noah Harari, who's a very famous historian, he's written uh, most recently a famous book called Homo Deus has argued that humans are little more than algorithms, that we are very complex information sorting machines. Now, to be clear, evolutionarily and biologically and physiologically, there are arguments to be made for all of these things, right? Exactly how our atoms came together to form our bodies or exactly what our minds do with the information that we encounter in the world. I I'm not arguing that these that these ideas have no merit. However, what I am saying is that as physicians, I believe that what we have learned from our many hours discussing on the podcast is that we are called to be witnesses to humans being something more than just algorithms or random collocations of atoms. Our experience with humans and the human conditions as physicians, think for a moment about one of your most meaningful physician encounters whether that was a moment in the clinic when you had a breakthrough with a patient who had a diff difficult chronic medical program problem and you felt like you finally had a moment of connection where a light bulb went off and they were able to change something in their life, or whether this was a time when you were in the hospital taking care of a patient with a perplexing diagnostic dilemma and you finally stumbled on the thing that brought the answer and allowed them to get better, or whether this was like we heard about a moment ago, you working with a patient in the hospital who was getting sicker and sicker and sicker and then ultimately died. What I would argue is that the patients for whom we care amount to more than the sum of their biological parts. Beyond the limits of known biology and physiology lies the ineffable, ineffable mystery of what makes a human human. Because that's important, I want to pause and say it again. Beyond the limits of known biology and physiology lies the ineffable mystery of what makes a human human. I have given a lot of thought to this because as an oncologist, I have spent a good amount of time around people who are dying. When I attend on the inpatient oncology service, I usually do it for two weeks at a time. And when I do that, it is the exception rather than the rule that we not have a patient that dies. Almost every time I'm on the inpatient service, we have someone who dies and often we have two or three or four people. That's just the nature of how sick the people that we're taking care of are. And what I have recognized over and over again as I take care of patients who are dying is that there is a categorical qualitative difference between a living human being and a dead body. A dead body is not just less of the same thing as a living human. They are categorically different, and there is something that, that ceases to exist, something that flees, something that disappears at the moment of death. And I think that anyone who has cared for dying patients senses intuitively that this is true. And we likewise can sense that we, we know that this is true. We know that humans are more than the sum of their biological parts when we witness the kindness, grace, courage, and compassion that so often assert themselves at moments of greatest suffering. In other words, even if you wanted to argue that what you are seeing in the function of the lungs and the heart and the kidneys and whatever in the patient that you're taking care of, even if you wanted to argue that those things can be reduced to their biological parts, that still does not explain the experience, for example, of human love that binds together 
those who are sick and those who care about them. Now, I want to be clear, this is not a question of religion. And in fact, I would argue that religion in certain iterations may just as easily hinder as facilitate the understanding that we are hinting at here, rather than a specific formulation of whatever it is that we're talking about, whatever that more is that a human is more than the sum of their biological parts, however you want to formulate that. I'm not talking about a specific formulation. People could call that spirit or soul or consciousness or mind or whatever word you want to use. But what I'm talking about is not so much the details of the specific formulation of what that thing is, as, as I am arguing that we need to have an attitude that includes sufficient humility to agree with Hamlet from Shakespeare's play by the same name, that there are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamt of in our philosophy or our science. It's the humility of recognizing that we don't know everything that allows the sense of mystery to return. Now, I recognize that I'm treading on fraught ground, right? I didn't get very much sleep last night thinking about the fact that I was going to show up to medical grand rounds this morning and talk about things like spirit and soul and quote from Hamlet and Shakespeare and whatever else. But I would argue that just as we see these same things in the room of a patient who's dying, almost everyone has had some experience with this in a moment, at least I hope we have, out at night under an un polluted, unfiltered, starry sky. There is a sense of, to Dr. Keltner's point, wonder, awe, grandeur, being part of something that is something more than just gaseous orbs burning themselves into exhaustion light years away, that we sense in the beauty as opposed to just the physics and the astronomy of the stars. And that at its core is the lesson that our podcast has taught us. So much of our training and our medical thinking consists of reducing complex problems to their constituent parts, right? This is the blessing and the curse of the problem list. Everybody, when they're going to medical student medical school, learns about a problem list. As a person who teaches medical students a lot, I drill them on how to create a problem list. I impress upon them over and over and over again that they're not going to be able to communicate clearly or even think clearly as they care for complicated patients unless they learn to distill the person's presentation down to a manageable problem list that they can then use to make decisions about how best to offer the patient care. However, we become so well versed in making people into problem lists that we sometimes come to act as if we believe that an entire person can be summed up in a list of their active medical problems. We suggest that further, and one of the, and the, the other thing that we have learned from our podcast is that this is not just a vague philosophical shift. This is not just a thing that you come and listen to this grand rounds and think, oh, well, that was so intriguing and then go on your merry way. But actually, there are concrete daily learnable behaviors that can help us to relearn that medicine is not purely a reductionistic art. And I want to just very briefly mention, I could mention a whole long list. We could have a whole grand rounds just about the concrete daily actions, but I want to list just three. We spoke with one doctor, for example, who suggested that in every one-liner, right, so everybody knows about the one-liner, that for every one-liner for a patient, instead of just saying the patient's name, age, stated gender, and a list of their active medical problems, that we also include their career, a pet's name, a favorite band, and a favorite food. Now, I know this sounds a little bit funny, but let me just give you an example of what this does. It takes us from a 56-year-old man with a history of metastatic colon cancer who presented with a PE to a 56-year-old former mechanic who loves the Grateful Dead, fine sushi, and his Great Dane, Gus, who has a history of metastatic colon cancer and presents with a PE. Now, you may find that a little bit funny. That may sound a little bit over the top, but think for just a moment about what that has done, just the insertion of those 10 or 12 words has done to, no pun intended, flesh out this patient for whom we're caring as a person who is fully human, 
rather than as a patient who can be reduced to his constituent medical problem parts. By the same token, we had a physician who came on the program who talked about how when he sees patients in the ICU, remember many of these patients are intubated and at least as far as we can tell, don't even know that he's interacting with them, but he kneels at the bedside. And he does this as a way of demonstrating humility and respect and as a way of putting himself on a level, literally eye to eye level with the patients for whom he is caring. And then finally, we spoke with another physician who made it clear that in addition, even though this, patient, this doctor was not a palliative care physician where they do this all the time, but made it clear that just part of this physician's regular practice was to ask about spiritual needs. So in other words, in addition to taking care of the heart and the lungs and all of the rest, this physician would say to the patient, and is there anything that you need spiritually, anything, if you will, that we can do to attend to your soul, whether that has to do with a given religion or not? So in summary, I want to make clear again that we acknowledge the many systemic issues that plague medicine, and we recognize that those systemic issue, issues hinder our ability to find meaning, but we also, and I want to acknowledge that those same systemic issues make it more difficult to do the very things that we are talking about, right? because we have less time and because we are worried about RVUs and because we have to be with the EMR and because all of these other things, I recognize that this is complicated. I recognize that these are not a silver bullet. Nonetheless, we believe these conclusions to be true. A posture of genuine humility, of acknowledging the irreducible and ineffable mystery that lies at the heart of human existence, fosters an intuitive sense of awe even of reverence towards the privilege of caring for others at their most desperate hour. And the return of that sense of reverence for the beauty and gravity of our calling will return presence to our practice of medicine and a greater measure of meaning to our lives. And with that, I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Dr. John, that, John that, was, that was wonderful and clearly from comments and, and questions, very thought provoking. Uh, and for people who haven't watched your podcast, I imagine they're going to watch it. And by the way, we'll send out a link to it. I meant to do that earlier as well as our, as well as our follow-up emails. Um, I, you have a lot of great practical ideas. I want to get into those more. Uh, it reminds me, uh, you, you interviewed Dr. Harmon. I just saw her the other day on wards and she was rounding with us with a, one of those mobile uh, chairs. And so she can sit at the bedside of her patients and uh, what, remind me of kneeling at the bedside and those great practical things. Uh, so uh, a lot of wonderful things happening here. I love the fact that you're bringing those to our attention. And I want to talk to you more about practical ways we can bring meaning to patients. I first want to queue up uh, Dr. Verghese, who has a question and comment. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Errol. Tyler, I'm just so very proud of you. This is such a deeply meaningful uh, grand rounds. And I think, uh, you know, it's rare that uh, a talk lives up to its billing, but you really, really have done that. And I was struck by the fact that in many ways, you're talking about the distinction between healing and curing. I mean, if we think about the horse and buggy doctor of uh, 150 years ago, they had so little to offer. And yet, by their presence, by their house calls, you know, they, they brought about comfort. And in the early years of HIV, I was struck by, by that same sense that in the absence of any medications, uh, you know, just going to see the patient had a profound effect that I wasn't prepared for. And it, it made me understand that every illness has both a physical component, but also a sense of spiritual violation. And, you know, the, you're kneeling at the bedside, you're putting your hands on the patient. I had an ICU attending who always insisted we put our hands on the patient when we presented, that we were no longer just presenting details about the ventilator dialysis. We were talking about this person. But anyway, I just wanted to say how extraordinarily proud I am of you and delighted that you have such a large audience and I hope it grows. So keep this up. Terrific. Uh, 
Th thank you, Dr. Verghese. I, I remember actually reading, I think when I was an intern around then uh, in my own country about uh, an experience which it's been long enough that I'll get the details wrong, but you attending to a, a young man in the HIV pandemic or HIV epidemic who was dying, I think maybe from PCP or something in the ICU, there was nothing that you, nothing that you could do in terms of curing, but just being there. And I think the patient maybe put your hand or your stethoscope on their chest, uh, which serves as a powerful symbol, I think, of that. And, and that gets to the fact, again, I'm so struck that both an ICU physician and an ICU nurse, when asked to present an example of a distillation of what's most meaningful about their work, did not talk about the person who was this close to death, and then we did a hundred different things, and then they got better and left the ICU. Both of them talked about a time when they had no cure to offer, and yet by lighting candles and playing music or by drawing a uh, half dome or whatever it was on the on the glass door, we're able to care for them in spite of not having a cure. While I have Dr. Harmon up here, uh, Dr. Harmon, would you like to ask that question now? Sure. Thanks so much, Dr. Johnson. This is wonderful. Um, I um, I remember when uh, when we were chatting actually on the podcast, one of the topics that came up uh, was the topic of grief. Um, I think at the time it was actually grief for many things in medicine. Um, uh, it was earlier in the pandemic. I was curious how that theme has arisen um, since now it's been, I think probably 70 plus hours since that time we spoke. Um, Cause I was, I was curious around, um, I think both the clips you mentioned around uh, death in the ICU, for example, or just that um, experience of, of meaning um, in those moments and then the loss uh, as well, so. Yeah, so I, you know, it's really interesting because what I have recognized through these discussions that we have had is that this sounds counterintuitive, uh, almost paradoxical, but I have found it largely to be true that as physicians, I think we are much often much less comfortable with grief than a lay person might expect us to be, right? You would think we're doctor. I mean, how could you not be comfortable with grief if you're a doctor, right? But actually, what I think often happens is that we develop such a reflexive reaction against problems that we can't fix, that if we don't have a fix, then it's just like, oh, this is, let's call palliative care, <laughs> right? Like, no offense to Dr. Harmon, but but that's often sort of, that's like, well, we tried the antibiotics and the pressors and the ventilator, and they're still not getting better. So let's call palliative care now to deal with whatever is left after that, right? Now, I mean, no disrespect to palliative care doctors. I sort of think of myself as a palliative care doctor. I'm taken. Well. <laughs> but, but, but the point is, and, and I want to be clear that there is a skill set, right? There is a, there are things that you guys learn in fellowship that have to do with uh, engaging that, that molten core of suffering, as, as we heard in the one clip, um, that, that are, that there are learned skills. But all of that being said, mm -hmm. I think that part of the reason that this embrace of the ineffable mystery of the human condition matters for us is precisely because it allows us when we come up against that place of grief that can't be solved or cured to just, as palliative care doctors sometimes like to say, don't just do something, sit there, right? Just be with the grief and just be present with the patient, even if you can't fix whatever it is that's causing the pain. Thanks. Thank you for that. Dr. Dunn? Hi, Dr. Johnson. That was just an incredible talk. Thank you so much for that. I'm wondering, you know, so many of us love the human connection we get with our patients. <clears throat> how do you, how do you deal with yourself and how do you advise trainees on how to really get these connections when we are in direct conflict with time or lack of time, especially, you know, on the wards or in double booked clinics. I feel like I had a patient just the other day, I was very behind and 
you know, he came in and he said, I, I, said, I apologize. I'm so sorry. I'm late. But he said, I'm, I'm the most sorry that we're not going to be able to have one of our famous conversations. And I kind of took a step back. I'm like, well, sure, we still can. I'm not going to cut that off. But in a way, I was like, I have to. How do you how do you deal with that? And how do you advise the trainees? Yeah, well, so I want to be clear that nothing that I've talked about solves any of the systemic issues, right? Nothing, none of this takes away RVUs or double booked clinics or having to, you know, take care of 25 patients on an inpatient service or any of those things. But having said that, I will say two things. One is that I do believe while there is some amount of the problem that is unavoidable because it has to do with time constraints, there is another part of the problem that has to do with the way that we are when we are with a patient, like the, the presence that we bring into the room, right? And so one of my favorite examples of this is this ICU doctor who kneels at the bedside of his patients. Kneeling takes no more time than standing. But there is, and I have, I actually also do this when I'm on the inpatient wards, try, not you specifically, Dr. Dunn, but anybody, try it. The next time you're on the inpatient service, spend a day kneeling at the bedside of your patients and watch the way that it changes. It, like it, it is a constitutional difference. It is categorically different. It, it just, it recasts the entire encounter and it does not take one second longer. By the same token, the last time that I was on the inpatient service, the inpatient oncology service at Stanford, I asked, you know, the, the residents have a, like a, um, sometimes they call it a scut sheet, but a, like a reductionistic sheet where they where they can have all the information about the patients in you know one or two pieces of paper to hand off to the night float or whatever. And the most important thing that goes on that sheet is they actually type the one liner into the into the uh, patient's chart. And so I asked them to put into that one liner those four things that I mentioned there at the end, the person's career and pet's name and favorite food and and favorite band. And again, okay, maybe that takes 15 seconds longer or something, right? But but it totally recasts how you think about the patient, right? If you get called at two in the morning about the 56-year-old with colon cancer versus the 56-year-old who loves the Grateful Dead and has a dog named Gus, it's just different, right? It's a person, not a patient that can be reduced down to. So so all of that is to say, and, and we try to be very careful on the podcast, virtually every episode, even if we're way up here for part of it, talking about Hamlet and philosophical issues and the soul and whatever, invisible <laughs> complexity, like even if we're doing all that stuff for 45 minutes at the end, we always try to bring it down and say, well, okay, yeah, but what about for the busy intern? How does the busy intern actually implement what we're talking about into their daily practice? Thank you. Dr. Johnson, we have some great questions on Q&A, and I also have Dr. Skeff, who's going to hop on a video as well. But let me go to this question first. Uh, Dr. Barry asked, Tyler, beautiful grand rounds. Eric Topol has written about AI and its efficacy will let us go back to the bedside and become more humane physician, I mean, more humane physician. Do you see the future of AI mitigating burnout? Lastly, as a global health doc, I would argue meaningful purpose as a physician also encompasses being part of helping the less fortunate. Well said. Yeah, I well, yeah. So Dr. Barry, uh, I mean, absolutely that last part, you know, amen plus one and plus one again in terms of helping the less fortunate. I mean, that that is the uh, well, all of us, well, anyway, that is absolutely at the heart of medicine. Um, in terms of the AI question, uh maybe. I'm, you know, there were a lot of promises about that the electronic medical record was going to make the practice of medicine more efficient. Uh, that has not happened. However, I think you could make an argument that it has not happened because we chose not to center the core, the heart of medicine in the way that we have implemented the EMR. And because we haven't centered it, we chose to center uh, profit rather than patients at the center of the EMR experience. And as a consequence, I would argue that probably not surprisingly, when we chose to center profit, we have uh, maximized profit and we have, I would say, taken away from the, the doctor-patient encounter. And so I think that AI is a tool, right? Until it becomes sentient and autonomous, AI is a tool. And as long as it's a tool, I think that its effects on our ability to practice medicine uh, meaningfully 
will be a function of how we choose to implement the tool. If we can, unlike what we've done, I would argue with the EMR, if we can figure out a way to implement AI that centers the patient and the physician, then maybe Dr. Topol will be right. If not, I am skeptical, but I hope to be proven wrong. Dr. Johnson, we have a lot of great questions and I wanna to get to a couple with Dr. Kenny and, and, and Dr. Golden always has some wonderful questions. I wanna to try to get to some, but I wanna say when I think of practicing medicine with meaning, one of the doctors that has always come to my mind since day one is Dr. Skeff. Dr. Skeff. No, oh, Errol, you are so kind. Uh, Tyler, what a moving talk you've given, and I have to echo Dr. Verghese in saying how, how proud we are to be a colleague of yours. Um, your comment on how to bring in the meaningful aspects of a patient prior to the medical history uh, reminds me of Dr. Lars Osterberg's suggestion that we begin with our presentation with the parts of the social history that let us know the person before we begin with that let us know what the disease is. But the one thing I wanna comment about you today is you. Uh, from the moment you got to Stanford till now, what is coming across and why you are resonating so much with us is not what you're telling us to do, but who you're reminding us of who we are. And I think that that's what's coming across today. And I just wanna thank you for the courage to show who you are as you decide what you do uh, to help patients because they're helping us and you are helping us today. So thank you for being who you are and being courageous enough to lay it out there as to say who we are as human beings and how we help each other. So thank you so much, Tyler. Well, you, you all are awfully kind and I, I uh, deeply appreciate the very kind comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Skeff. Uh, uh, Dr. Johnson, if it's okay, can we go a couple more minutes to try to yeah. get yep. Dr. Kianian asks, maybe you will touch on this later, but it would be interesting to know your thoughts on also how the economics of medical, medical practice from a higher political level is playing into burnout, insurance, national policies, healthcare spending, and how that trickles down into different systems doctors work within. What can we do about it to actually promote change in the direction that not only helps avoid burnout, but also better care to patients? Thank you. Dr. Chu just mentions maybe hospital administrators uh, should watch your grand rounds. <laughs> yeah, I. so um, we have had some of those conversations too on the podcast. We've uh, gotten into economics of reimbursement and all of that uh, to some smaller degree as well. I think that the, so I would say two things are important important at the same time. The first one is that, as I mentioned at the beginning, and there's a reason that I spent the first 10 minutes the way that I spent it, we want to be clear that systemic issues need systemic fixes. And, and so, you know, there may be things that only the director of CMS or, uh, you know, whatever, the director of Kaiser or whomever, there may be things that only people in those kinds of positions can do. And so I, you know, I advocate for people who care about this to uh, try to occupy positions of power and influence where they can make those decisions. We spoke with um, one of the more interesting and different interviews that we've had was a medical student who, after he graduated from medical school, became uh, an uh, investor, uh, person who helps to direct healthcare investment. And one of the things that we said to him in a slightly pointed exchange on the program is that like as someone who has medical training, I would consider it part of his ethical obligation, frankly, to make sure that they invest in companies that are genuinely committed to, as I mentioned about AI, centering the experience of the patient and the physician in the way that we use AI rather than centering profit. Profit is always going to be the default, right? And if profit is centralized in the way that we build the next generation of healthcare, whether you're talking directly about healthcare, I mean, about a payment or about AI uh, utilization or whatever it is, if profit is the center, then profit is what we will get. But the problem is that we often get profit at the expense of the experience, both of patients and physicians. And so I would argue that what is needed is people in positions of power and influence who remember that fostering and facilitating the human connection that lies at the heart of medicine cannot be the thing that you do after you've already built the whole thing, then say, oh, and by the way, you know, be nice to your patients. That doesn't work, right? We have to build the systems so that those principles are centered in the first place.
Dr. Johnson, I might just quickly get in one more question from Dr. Golden because he had a number of great ones up here. Uh, sure. I might put the one about, since you're an educator, uh, do you feel that teaching can help burnout? Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. I think that there is, um, it, yeah, I, I, so just as it is the case, so here's one thing that I we commented on, on a recent episode of the podcast that the more I think about it, the more I think it is true. You know, I mean, as I said, I spend a lot of time teaching medical students about problem lists, just as one example, right? And problem lists are absolutely vital to the way that we practice medicine. I wouldn't know how to practice medicine without using a problem list. But at the same time, it is also the case that we have to learn those things. And then in a sense, we kind of have to unlearn those things, right? Um, by the same token, many people learn when they're an intern how to do a super efficient, and by efficient, I usually mean brief physical exam, because if you have to pre-round on 15 patients before you round at you know, eight in the morning, you have to be able to do that if you're also going to get some sleep. But then when you're not an intern who has to pre-round on all those patients anymore, you need to unlearn how to do that super efficient thing so that you can then relearn how to do an exam that, as Dr. Verghese was talking about a minute ago, really does justice to the more uh, the more holistic and expansive sense of what it means to be a physician. And so I think that there is a sense in which as educators, and, and I say this in particular to people who uh, have uh, um, medical students, residents, whatever, who come to their clinic or who work with them on the wards, I think that one of the things we always have to be mindful of is what is both the written and unwritten curriculum that the people receive when they're in their formal training and which parts of those things, many of which to be clear, they may not even be aware of, which of those things do we need to help them unlearn or untangle the wires so that they can get back to practicing what is ironically the way that I think most people want to practice when they come into the field in the first place. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.